good afternoon or good evening, everybody. It's uh, 10 to 8 here in, uh, I'm in the northwest corner of Australia. Um, so I think the way it will work is, is I will let you know when I want the slide changed, okay? So there's somebody in the room there who can change the slides. Is that correct? Okay. So let me just thank people for this endeavor, this project, Open Access Movement. Um, and thank you for allowing me to talk about um, my project, which is the constitutional law textbook project um, that I have been engaged with, uh, with the li uh, librarians, um, Jill, Reggie, and Sadiq. And what I'm going to do is, let me tell you what I'm going to do in the 15 minutes that's been allocated to me. Can you go to the second slide? I'll just give you a, an outline of my presentation. I'm really going to be focusing on three things. So the first thing I will do is talk a little bit about the background to this e-book. Uh, the second, I will look at the factors underlying the approach to the e-book and how the e-book took the shape that it, it is taking. And then the third is, is looking at the constitutional law e-book looking at the content, the delivery of materials, the teaching methodology, assessment, and so on. So it's just to give you a sense of how this, uh, the constitutional law ebook fits in with the project of open access and clearly around social justice. Uh, please go to the third slide. I like that slide because it shows uh, President Mandela calling into the constitutional committee uh, in 1995 when South Africans were asked to make a, a contribution to the final constitution. And it's basically, it's an iconic picture just to show that everybody was asked to be involved in the, um, you know, in the drafting of this constitution and why the constitution is so important with respect to uh, transformation and particularly uh, uh, um, transformation of legal education and access to justice. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the background, um, because I think we may have forgotten at this point how we come to this point and how important it is to think about constitutional law as an innovative and a very, very important part of legal education. In fact, the key in many ways to training the next generation of legal professionals. And I always use this quote from the former Chief Justice Pius Langer in which he outlines very, very clearly what the promise of the Constitution was. And that quote is, is, is that transformation is a permanent ideal, a way of looking at the world that creates a space in which dialogue and contestation are truly possible, in which new ways of, of, of being are constantly explored and created. And he goes further to say that the change to legal education is a change in mindset not simply a change in the laws. So to start off with, it's very, very important to think about constitutional law, not just as another area of law, another uh, sort of uh, discipline in which we focus on the statute, the cases, and so on. Constitutional law is the key to transforming all the areas of law that we teach. And so to some extent, constitutional law and the way we teach constitutional law goes a long way to helping us think through what it is that the next generation of legal professionals must do to make the Constitution a reality. Now, the Constitution is not just this document that's there, that we sort of, that has, that signals the end of apartheid, it's the end of a process, and so on. But con the, the whole constitutional project, and it has to be included in constitutional law, is really about three things. It's about invitation, engagement, and contestation. In other words, it's an invitation to law students and law lecturers to engage with the Constitution and contest its meanings. We're contesting the Constitution, for example, right now in the whole question of access to land and whether we can expropriate land without compensation. We can, actually. The Constitution provides for that. The Constitution provides for a range of things, the whole governance project. And so therefore we've got to approach constitutional law with this vision of transformation, not just an add-on, as I said, 
not just unsettling, but really, really overtur uh, to overturning both the vision and the practice of law. So the points of departure have got to be about law students and, and, uh, and law academics, law lecturers, training students to see the possibilities of law and to teach students strategic legal skills to make access to justice possible. So I wonder if you can go to slide five. Um, so the, uh, the, the first slide, I've just given you some background. I don't have a lot of time, but in those few minutes, I wanted to give you a sense of you know, the, the Constitution itself. And it's, it's been there for the last 27 years. And in fact, it's given us a, a framework. So the second thing I wanted to talk about were the factors that were sort of uh, were underpinned um, uh, the approach to this uh, e-constitutional book. The first is obviously there's so much free material uh, on the web from the Constitution, all the Constitutional Court judgments, the Constitution itself, the writings of many, many people, uh, particularly South Africans, particularly Africans, global scholars, and so on. So to some extent, the Constitutional Law e-textbook really is a demonstration that nobody should pay for a Constitutional Law textbook. And so now we have the opportunity to think about um, uh, the factors that gave rise to it. And it, as, I, as you can see from the PowerPoint, there was the University of Cape Town as a strategic plan. You must be aware of the curriculum change working framework, which was just um, um, sort of posted about two months ago. Um, UCT uh, has gone through a, the law school has gone through an accreditation process. So, it, and we've also seen the demands of the students around decolonizing, equity, and so on. So all of these factors, these are influences in the book. And it's really got us to think creatively about how we're going to teach and what this book will look like. So let me go um, to the next slide. Um, to think th through the framework of the book, and then I'll go to the actual topics themselves within the book. So when you look at this, if you look at uh, slide six, what you're really looking at is, is, is the creation of the professional development of the legal, uh, of the legal professional that graduates from a law school. In other words, when we're thinking about a UCT law graduate, what are we thinking about? What, are, what is this person? What kind of values does this person embody? And how are we going to create, make it possible? So in other words, how do we shape the professional identity of this legal professional who's going to go out there and provide access to justice? And these things, all of you in the room know more about this than what I do. And these are issues that have constantly come up, but it's worth reiterating. So the first is, is that once people, once a law student or a high school student is recruited and admitted at the university, that's the start of the professional development. And then the next part of this is the advising and the mentoring that goes in. Because part of what has happened Certainly at the University of Cape Town and at many universities and many law schools, students, many students who don't come in with a social capital, whose parents are not professionals, um, and who are first generation um, university students and a huge number at UCT, predominantly black, um, advising and mentoring is key to shaping that particular professional identity. And the third part of that is, is, is that in a law school, students are going to need to be exposed to the practice of law, because law is a profession, it's a practice. So internships, clinics, other kinds of possibilities have become part of the way that we think about our teaching as well, and then going to the, the professional career uh, of students. Um, go to the next slide. When we were thinking, so if you look at, at slide uh, uh, um, eight, 
Can well, you think about, when I, mean, I thought about the constitutional law ebook, one of the issues that law lecturers and many professional lecturers obviously have to address constantly is where are our students going? It's not just a crude sort of where the jobs are, but really getting a sense of where graduates go. So I've taken from um, the UCT and other universities and from my own experience, my own background, looking at where law graduates go. And that's just a list of the places where they go. Large and small law firm practice, government, public interest, some go to the bar, some become academics, some increasingly or what we would now call legal entrepreneurs, they do startups, they're involved in technology and so on. Um, then many go into business, they actually go into the business and the corporate sector, and then some seek international opportunities. Now these career paths, where our graduates go, have to influence how we teach and what we teach. Go to um, a slide now, uh, slide uh, uh, eight, which is the next slide skills for the 21st century South African law professionals. When you think about what we aim to achieve in our classes, and I'll come to the content of the uh, constitutional law textbook, we really need to think creatively about the kinds of skills that we want to teach students. And I'm using the word skills here in a very simplistic way. But the research now has is a lot of research, both from graduates as well as employers, etc., to look at the kinds of skills that law graduates need in the 21st century. And yeah, I'm looking at 21st century South Africa today. How do we think about the kinds of skills that our graduates need and how do we inculcate that in the classroom? So I've given you a list on the left-hand side, the traditional skills which law graduates traditionally have, and then the additional skills. So the first is, you know, the first set is about sound judgment, close reading and attention to detail, time management, analytical ability, logical reasoning, persuasiveness, advocacy, those are the tools of the lawyer, and communication skills, obviously, very strong written and oral communication skills. But they are now, when we think about how legal professionals operate in the world and what the kinds of things that we are trying to um, teach our students. First, a very, very important part, a very important skill of students is um, emotional intelligence and networking. The ability to be able to read people, the ability to be able to uh, work in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a world that requires you to step outside of yourself. Project management. Students, this is a skill that's important because legal work and so on is very, very much about project management. The skills of collaboration and empathy. Teamwork has always been what many, many professions know. Lawyers or legal professionals have been slow to appreciate that the skills of collaboration are very, very important and then the skills of empathy. And when I talk about empathy, I talk about cultural competence about not just thinking about the world in a unicultural way, but really being able to appreciate that you're living in a, in a sort of, to, to use a, a hackneyed term, a multicultural world. And specifically in South Africa, when we think about being, moving from a European-centric notion of law to an African-centric notion of law, the question of empathy and cultural uh, uh, appreciation is very, very key. And then, very, very important, financial literacy. There's, you know, there used to be the joke that lawyers, people became lawyers because they couldn't understand math and that they couldn't get into medical school. But the reality is, is that everybody has to have some financial literacy. And then finally, technology has really changed the practice of law. And so the ability to be tech savvy and to think creatively and innovatively about technology is another skill. So those are what we need to, those skills are what we need to bring to think about when we shape our courses, when we do curriculum planning and so on. Um, all right, so, so now to move to this sort of, again, you all know this, that we've moved away from this idea of, you know, the all important, 
lecturer who's on the stage, you know, the sage on the stage, we all talk about guides on the sides, you know this. But what I did here was really to center students and to point out the sort of circle within which, the orbit within which the others operate. So the academic staff is very important, the course coordinators and so on, but the alumni as well. So thinking about student-centered learning is not just about what happens in the classroom, but also outside the classroom and the kinds of relationships that students will need in order to succeed. So let me now go on to the constitutional law ebook. And I'm going to talk on these four questions, um, four issues uh, with the with the with the ebook. Um, so the first is this question of content. Um, what essentially are we including in the in the content of the ebook uh, that's very very different? So the first is that we are taking the constitutional, as I said earlier. Looking at the Constitution as a vehicle for transformation, about real access to justice. So we're not just approaching this text as a text with the Constitution and the rules, but it's a, and, and, and the provisions of the Constitution. We're starting off with the sort of historical background, but really, really important historical background to introduce the students to the laws of apartheid at a very fundamental level and the legacy particularly and the context within which the constitution arose and with which we still operate. So we tend to, uh, and again I'm, say, I'm not saying that other constitutional law texts don't do this. Um, this is very, very important. Uh, it, it, it's, it's something that um, we've, we've certainly saw as, very, uh, as key to the way that we structure the book. Uh, I'm not going to go through all the chapters because there are 14 chapters, but let me just mention some pertinent parts about the content. Um, we're looking at constitutional values and goals, and particularly we engage with this idea of transformative constitutionalism and what it means to take the Constitution to make a difference to people's lives. Uh, we look at the whole, we take the whole Constitution and the way that the Constitution outlines constitutional democracy, cooperative governance, uh, judiciary. We look at the state institutions supporting constitutional democracy. Everybody seems to know about the public protector, but people don't seem to appreciate that there are a range of other bodies like the Human Rights Commission, the Gender Commission, and so on. These are all bodies that are uh, as a, a part of the constitutional framework and are constitutionally mandated bodies. We look at specifically the prosecution authority and so on, the Bill of Rights, all the various rights and so on, and we engage with all these rights in a way to, to get students to think how they can take what's in the Constitution to pursue those rights at a very, very fundamental level. Um, with respect to uh, the second part, uh, so we've got content. The delivery of the materials, which is key. It's pointless having a nice book, a good book, which sort of attempts to address these issues in a comprehensive way. So the delivery of the materials is key. So a book of this kind, we're very fortunate. There's a, as I said, there's a ton of free materials on the web that students have access to. Um, so the possibility of delivering the materials is interactive because there's a range of visual, visual materials that students can use and that will be part of uh, the teaching. So it is about you know, YouTube and video and all kinds of ways that we think about the delivery of the material and not just um, uh, the text. Um, then the third is the question of teaching methodologies. What kind of teaching methodologies will we adopt um, to really make a difference, to give effect to this sort of idea of access to justice and also creating the sort of empowering students to be able to do this. So again, some of these, many of you are very familiar with this and you know, I've learned from, from um, some of you about this, but firstly, that it's very, very clear that we have to be very, very clear with the students about, you know, in the course, about the learning out outcomes, to clarify what the learning outcomes are to identify the teaching goals. And so right from the, from the beginning, it's a contract 
between the lecturer and the student about what the expectations in this class. Um, and then the third methodology has got to do around student assigned projects. So the idea is if students are going to take responsibility for their learning and be empowered to think about the constitution creatively, then a lot of the work through class exercises, simulations, role playing and so on, allows for the students to engage with the material at a very, very uh, concrete level and hopefully in an exciting and interesting way. Um, so essentially what they will be encouraged to do it, through these teaching methodologies is to develop critical awareness of the social, legal, philosophical, and the political content of their work. So it's not just being a legal professional, but understanding all these other uh, factors that go into the lawyer's status and the lawyer's role, and particular pay attention to professional and ethical uh, expectations. And then finally, assessment. The sort of the idea is is that we should not we should think creatively. Again, all of you have thought about this about assessment not beyond exams and standard tests. So the first thing that hopefully the, the constitutional law textbook will signal throughout is this idea of that uh, 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 sort of lifelong learning. So the approach is one of inquiry and not just conclusion. So the students get into the habit of constant asking questions because that's what you are going to do as the law changes, etc. That law, that, that, that legal professionals think creatively about the questions. Uh, the second is, is that students are assessed not just on the content of the law, because the law does change, but of course students have to know the law, but specifically ways to challenge the law for the purpose, to challenge the, the constitutional, the way that the constitution is, is stated, the text, interpretation and so on, to challenge it for the purpose of social justice. Um, the third way of assessment is to link those skills that I outlined earlier, you, look, you saw the list of traditional skills and additional skills, to really link assessment to skills, so that when you're writing, if we want to call them tests, that, 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 that there's a purpose, that these tests are linked to the skills that we think students should acquire. Um, a, a fourth way of assessment, which is always controversial, but it goes again to the skills that students have to, to learn, and that is working collaboratively, to think about group tasks, and to think about ways that students can do group projects as part of assessments. And then the, the, the other assessment that I think is important, that helps students grow in this role as a um, legal professional in training, is to think more creatively about the use of reflection pieces. So students do a few pieces of writing, and one or two may be reflection pieces, to also get students to think about simulations. You know, we can think about simulating cases, put students in the role of lawyer or judge. As I said, all of this is being done, uh, but this is what the constitutional law textbook will really be focusing on. And then finally, because I think I may have come to the end, I may be a little over my 15 minutes, uh, can you go to the last slide? And that is the library and technology resources in the class. The, the TE textbook really is linked to the resources in the library and the technology that can be used. That, so the idea is, is that there is continuous training in electronic research, in free legal resources, um, and using technology in the classroom instruction and so on, online outreach and networks, so that the class is linked continuously and creatively to the resources of the library. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, do the difficult job of closing the session today. I know Reggie's got some remarks after this. And I think we've had the most amazing dynamic discussion. And I feel a little sorry to actually interrupt the flow. <laughs> um, but I'm hoping that my presentation will 
give you some more insights into the open movement. Um, and very specifically today, I'm going to be talking about digital open textbooks for development. Um, and this is a, a small project that we have in the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching. Um, and I want to talk more about openness, open textbooks, um, and how these discussions that we've had today all fit together around uh, social justice and intersectionality um, and the approach we'd like to take um, with this particular project. Okay, so the context, and we've discussed the context, so I think some of the threads that I'm going to bring into the discussion that are in my slides have been touched on today. Um, and certainly the context for any open textbook project is curriculum change in higher education. And what we're doing here um, is questioning what knowledge and whose knowledge is being represented. And this is what we're now doing in our curriculum reform. We're looking at issues of representativity, who's excluded, who's included, um, taking a position, the gaps, silences and absences, who is invisible in our curriculum, and who is marginalised in our curriculum. And what I'd like to talk about today is the potential of open textbooks. Um, and we know from the student protests and the fallist movements, we have fees must fall, um, and we feel that open textbooks can certainly save cost issues, so an economic dimension, uh, the roads must fall movement. Um, we, can, we see how open textbooks can certainly address the cultural and political dimensions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about affordances of the open movement. So uh, Caroline very nicely introduced open education resources, and we have been talking about these earlier. Um, actually working. I'm going to just talk to that because this isn't really working. Um, so the idea with open education resources is that um, certainly they're mostly digital and they're openly licensed. So we've touched on those two as the key concepts around um, open education resources. And when we talk about open education resources, we can talk about something as simple as a, an image that you make open with an open license to course materials, to videos, to audio, um, and also to textbooks. So these open education resources have two key aspects um, that we've talked about already in the session that I would like to highlight as being quite powerful. So there's this idea of cultural inequality and how <coughs> having open materials that we create locally here at UCT in South Africa allows us to localize those materials. Um, the other thing that we do um, is this idea of economic injustice and being able to use open education resources and open textbooks to uh, deal with the idea of the cost of these materials to students. So when we talk about um, open educational resources, we need to kind of take a step back and reflect on our teaching and how we share teaching materials. And to share anything, we have to have a practice in place in the first place. And this is something in our minds, this is something that we do in our teaching, this is something perhaps we're passionate about, this idea that we want to share materials. And with that comes the sense of open education practices. And this is something I'd like you to think about. Um, the power of these open education practices um, to include voices um, and to collaborate with other academics and with students and with marginalized groups. So these are some of the key value propositions around those open educational practices. Um, so this idea of alternative epistemic views. Um, this is what we want to encourage right now at this point while we rethink our curricula. Um, we want to be able to collaborate not only with other academics, but we want to co-create with students. These are the values that we would like to propose. Uh, we can also circulate and share, obviously, with open education resources, but it also allows a critique from others of our resources. So putting our resources out there so other people can contribute, share, and critique them. 
So I've talked about open education resources, talked about open educational practices, and now I want to talk very specifically about open textbooks. Um, but I'm sure you can see how all these opens um, can fit together uh, to form that open education practices. But now I'd like to just focus on, on the textbook side. So we know about the cost of textbooks, and that's been a very interesting discussion. And unfortunately, the one presenter um, who was unable to be here could have really highlighted how inhibiting the cost of textbooks is for our students. Um, and this is part of, although we talk about fees must fall as the fees of instruction, of the fees that we pay for the university, the textbook certainly is just another conversation that we need to open up. Um, and so often we might not pay fees, but we cannot afford the textbook. So this is something, a, a crucial argument for open textbooks. And if we look at models, traditional models of textbook provision, um, we have these kind of full copyright um, examples on the left-hand side. This is our traditional way of looking at textbooks that are under full copyright, that are closed. Um, they can be in print and digital form, certainly, but they're expensive. Um, and what we're looking at is having certainly print open textbooks, digital open textbooks, but with open licenses that enable anyone to share and reuse those textbooks according to the license. So um, that copyright um, aspect is very important. So having Creative Commons and open licenses eliminates that full copyright and now you can actually access the, the resources and use those resources. So what are open textbooks? We've talked about this, um, and Penny um, outlined some of the exciting aspects in the law textbook that she's busy um, writing, um, and how we can really include um, different voices. So the basic principles of the open textbooks is that they're openly licensed, as I said, okay, usually digital, but not necessarily. Um, they're published in formats that integrate multimedia, and this is a very powerful thing, especially in light of our discussions here around disability. So here's an opportunity to have a textbook that also includes video, audio, and a whole lot of other components. Um, Yes, it can be in granular um, form, so little pieces that can be used as appropriate. You don't have to use the entire textbook, you can use part of it, um, and can be hosted on websites. So just if you're interested already, there are a lot of open textbooks out of there, out, out, out there. Um, <laughs> most of them are certainly in, in um, Europe and North America, um, but there are a lot of textbooks that can be used right now that are freely available. Um, to highlight in the middle, Siavula. Um, Siavula is, a lo is local, a local organization um, that has provided free textbooks um, at a school's level. So there's a lot of work that's already happening and a lot of freely open, openly available textbooks out there. Uh, just one example of um, OpenStax. These are textbooks out of the USA, but they are freely available for anyone to be used to use and they have been used um, across the globe. So what's happening at UCT? Um, actually quite a bit um, and so I just want to highlight one or two um, little examples. I can't go into too much detail now, I don't have too much time. Um, but we have a number of early adopters who have created textbooks. Um, they haven't had any support from uh, our unit SILT or any of the other units. They have felt a personal, passionate drive to make their teaching materials open. They have seen a need, often, in, in this case, specifically across Africa for these, specific, for these materials. Uh, when this particular author, um, Johann Fagen, wanted to make his textbook that he had written open, um, the publisher said no. So he decided to rewrite it, and that's exactly what he did, and, and collaborated with experts from all around the world. So just one example. Um, and there are a whole bunch of other examples that are available on OpenUCT. So certainly cutting costs, um, and here's another example from physics, where the lecturers have actually used the, that OpenStax textbook that I mentioned earlier um, as the prescribed textbook. It's in physics, so um, it works for them. They can actually use it within their course. 
So, uh, yeah, the last few slides I'd like to talk about uh, this new initiative uh, that's coming out of SILT. Um, it's called DOT4D, the Digital Open Textbooks for Development Project. Um, and it has three components. It's going to be running over the next couple of years. Um, it, it comes with funding from um, the Canadians, actually. So we've managed to source some external funding uh, to get this project going. It has three main components. So I talked about that academics are doing some very interesting stuff already at UCT. There are models of open textbook provision already at UCT. So one of the key components of this project is to actually research those models um, and outline what's available, what the potential models are out there um, as a baseline research study. And this is at UCT, um, specifically at UCT. We also have a little bit of money to give academics grants to develop open textbooks. Uh, they may already have some open materials, they may want to reuse open ma materials, or they may want to create open materials from scratch. And this gives us that unique opportunity to be considering all the elements that somebody like Aki was talking about um, right from the very beginning, thinking about open curriculum um, and including all disabilities and the content right from the very beginning. So this is a really unique opportunity um, that we'll be um, promoting soon. And then the third component is advocacy. And we talked um, a little earlier about kind of a lack of awareness. And although we know, we're all aware of open access, it's not broadly, not everybody knows about open access. And not everybody knows about open textbooks. So part of what we're going to be doing, Michelle and I, um, is to do some advocacy work across South Africa. So we want to use the research that we've done. We want to get stakeholders from across South Africa and other higher education institutions, um, as well as hopefully government, um, to be part of this conversation around open textbooks and just how important they are right now um, as we look at curriculum reform. So the project, very general um, objective, is this, is to contribute to improving inclusion in South African higher education by addressing equitable access to appropriate and, le and relevant learning resources. And in order to do that, we've got um, a conceptual frame that will be informing how we do our research, how we select our grant participants, um, and how we go about this entire project. Um, and to do that, we're going to be drawing on Nancy Fraser's social justice. And this has been talked about quite a bit. Um, and there are other frames of social justice. She's not the only social justice theorist. Um, but this particular framework has worked quite well in, for us to understand um, how to approach looking at open materials um, in terms of parity of participation. Because that's what we really want. We want that parity of participation. And that's what openness potentially can, can give us. So we want to make a strong argument for how we can address these issues. Um, and so I'm building on work that Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams started doing, that uh, Caroline mentioned earlier. Um, and this is something that's just recently been informing our work, that we've done research work in open education resources in the Global South. Um, and we want to take this work further into this new project as a way of starting from scratch and starting with this framework in mind in everything that we do. So we're going to be using the social justice approach. Um, and we've already talked about these three dimensions. And I won't go into detail now. I know I'm running out of time. Um, but I also want to just talk very briefly about intersectionality. And um, this is something that's very important to us. So to look at all these different aspects, the interconnected nature um, of all these different categories that we actually need to be looking at, um, different areas of discrimination, um, and these multiple areas, and how we can consider them in this particular project. So we're not only looking at um, race, education, we're looking at all these different dimensions, race, education, sexuality, ability, age, gender, ethnicity, culture, language, and class. So we want to approach this project using an intersectional approach. So we're going to tie those two together. So just to conclude, 
The idea of this particular approach to this open textbook project um, is to go beyond numbers of perhaps gender or race or other aspects that we know we want to address, but to actually look at all these different um, aspects, look at, look at cultural, political, and economic dimensions. Um, and importantly, um, our approach um, wants to consider the power of the agent um, and how important it is, how, all, how we are all very important in this process um, and how in our project we would like to empower people to be able to create um, these open textbooks and the people that do apply for grants to actually really consider their agency and how we can empower them. And that's, that's all for me. Thank you.